Okay. All right. We're ready. Also with you. Amen. Let us worship God. Let us be grateful that we can be together. And uh, let's see who's on Zoom today. We have several people. Harold and Gloria, Karen, Cindy, Kim Dotson, and Robin. So we're welcoming all these people into our midst here. And I love the way that Pastor Arlene always um, speaks um, our sisters and brothers in La Vallita, Cuba into our presence. And I remember she said, it always gives her goosebumps to mention them because I think it's a holy relationship and it's a holy friendship that reminds us that um, God's love indeed knows no boundaries or borders. And so they are with us, Pastor Sheila and Annabelle and all the family. Are there others you'd like to speak into our presence this morning that are not here today? Yeah, Vicki and Beth. Vicki and Beth? Beth. Beth. Some time? Yeah, that'd be nice. Eddie and Ann are out of town this weekend. Eddie and Ann? Adam and Jeff. Adam and Jeff and Gabrielle. And Jennifer and, and uh, Isaiah and Mary and Solomon are all at home not feeling well. Oh, mm -hmm. no. He's just a cold. They always sniff it. Okay. Chris and Craig. Craig. And how do I need to move? Okay. And I uh, remember Litzy and all of Lupe's family. We're so glad Lupe is here. Um, Stan. Stan is on his way from Madrid, Spain to New York City. And should be there later today, uh, around six o'clock. And he spends the night there. And some anonymous friend bought him a hotel, so he doesn't have to spend the night at the airport. Oh, nice. And so, so isn't that wonderful? And then he'll be back to Charlotte tomorrow. I'll pick him up. So, um, uh, Dana. No. And, um, by the way, we're all we're we're having to use the microphone from the computer because this one is not working. So, what does that mean for us? We're just doing just letting people can. know who are online. Okay. Well, there's always there's always little quirks with technology, but you remember that God is bigger than that. So, Amen. Um, and if someone else occurs to you, we can speak them in to our presence in the prayer time, but. And now it's um, time for our first hymn, which is? I decided to follow Jesus, number 31. Feel free to spend if you like, except for I mean. <laughs> hey, Jerry, would you like to
The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like springs from the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. Well, now we get to officially pray. I think whenever we gather, God is present and God is tending to our hearts and what we share through music and scripture and prayers. And, and uh, But now we want to name some special people. And um, I, you, I'm sorry I didn't do this at the beginning. We kind of sometimes get updates. But I want to start by saying I'm so glad Pastor Arlene is here. Woo! And she's gone through her surgery and Jay's faithful accompaniment and sending out notices and pictures and good words and encouragement. So how can we pray, continue to pray for you? I am just looking forward to being back to 100% and I'm, I'm feeling good. So I thank you for your prayers. I'm a little sore, but um, not, uh, not anything that's out of the ordinary. So uh, I'm encouraged. Okay. And we'll pray for Jennifer and the kids that they recover quickly. And um, are there others that we want to give any updates before we um, have our time of silence and prayers? I think I said about Stan's on his way back. Um, I will mention um, Ken Miedema. Ken Miedema is a, a friend of the Circle of Mercy, a musician who has been blind since a very young age, and he's a He's an incredible musician, improvises and, and, and has many CDs and is just full of heart and his voice is just captivating. And he just had a, some kind of aneurysm all of a sudden uh -huh. in his stomach and it wasn't all that serious if they got it, you know, soon and they did and he's recovering, but his own, and so Ken meet him and his family, just pray for his recovery. Um, um, it was sort of like a shock and a relief all at the same time when we found out that he was already through the worst. Um, and I'll mention uh, a friend of a, a pastor in Cuba named Santiago, and he is in his final days. He's, um, and he's been going through a hard time with a lot, with apparently, you know, a lot of suffering. So Santiago's a, a friend, I don't know, a friend of a friend in Cuba. And then I have a good friend named Beth growing up, one of my oldest friends, and her father just died of a stroke. 
he was in the same place as my mom and dad where they were living and um so I, it's a it's a hard time but he lived well and was a, a theater professor and gave great encouragement and and life to so many people through the arts so his name was harold and we pray for his family anyone else wants anyone wants to give an update or in, in good news, um, I believe, uh, Cindy can correct me, but I believe that Jordan, her um, nephew Jordan, was on the national championship baseball team from Wingate, um, and they got national championship rings, and, and so they're all celebrating this small school that, uh, I think that's right, um, so that's good news. So Cindy's... Cindy's celebrating too. Yeah, yeah. So well, good for Jordan. Thanks yeah. for, for times of joy and celebration. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Cindy because we need to pray for Cindy and her little, her sweet little dog, uh, Buck, right? right? Who's um, got some kidney problems and been to the vet. So, so, so pray, you know, all of those you who have animals or, you know, they're part of the family. So, um, um, all right, well, let's, let's enter a, a, a time of silence and sharing our hearts and our, and as we breathe in, we can think about breathing in the spirit of God and breathing out God's grace toward those we love. And then um, I'll say a brief prayer that when we can, we can share names of folks that we want to lift up to. So let us join our hearts in prayer. Dear God, thank you for always listening to us, for always knowing what's on our hearts and what words are on our tongues to speak. And we pray that we would live and speak to your glory and to your honor. And we praise you for this chance to share the concerns and burdens and gratitudes of our heart. And so now we offer up special names and situations to you. Audrey Green. Sandra and Nina and Mary. Santiago and Ken Miedema and Beth and her family. Carol uh, Jones. Aline and her recovery, Jennifer and Kaziah and Raywell and Solomon. Stan Dotson. Chris and Jermaine. We thank you for hearing concerns on our hearts that we may not say out loud, but are still as precious to you. It's all, it's all the prayers that we have said out loud. And we thank you that you are always at work for healing and reconciliation and joy. That all of us may have the abundant life. And so, Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayers. prayers. We continue in prayer with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's time for our second hymn. 53. Feel free to say it. 
So now, I think, is it time for the kids' story? Yes. So, um, I am bringing in a mask, kind of an oversized mask of Bartimaeus. Stop, please. Uh, okay, I'll stop. Stand by. I need to stop, anyway. I gotta try to figure out what I'm, yeah. <laughs> anyway, just take a moment. I'll tell you all that this, I'll repeat this if you want, but if this is from Mark chapter 10, it's the end of Mark chapter 10, and the lectionary we're going through Mark, and so um, this is another kind of testimony. Okay, they can hear. Okay. I can't hear, but they can hear. <laughs> That's fine. This is from Mark chapter 10, and this is the story of blind Bartimaeus. And it's it's kind of in line of the testimony. We're getting ready to hear a testimony of Cliff. And so testimonies are basically about encounters we have with God. And so um, I want to tell you that Doug Berkey is my friend who's, a, who's an artist, a mime, clown, um, theater artist, and he made this mask. He is out of town, but he said that I could borrow it. And so I wanted to use it today to tell this text. And so I'm going to fix it up where you can see it. Okay, so this is the mask. Oh, wow. And so um, it's Bartimaeus is what his, his vision of what Bartimaeus might have looked like. So the story goes that Bartimaeus 
was on the side of the road as Jesus was leaving Jericho. And he was a beggar, which means he was vulnerable and he was desperate for anything that he could get. And so when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he started shouting out. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he was trying to find where Jesus was. Jesus, son of David, have mercy. But the crowd shouted at him, be quiet. Don't bother him. He's not interested in you. Just don't make such a ruckus. But Bartimaeus cried out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy, Jesus. And Jesus stopped and said, call him here. And Bartimaeus, being blind that he was, he threw off his, his cloak and he jumped up and he went in the direction of Jesus. And Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus said, please, master, I want to see again. Can you let me see again? And Jesus said, your faith has made you well. And immediately, he could see. He could see. And he looked all around, and he could see. And the people were amazed and astonished. And then Bartimaeus said, teacher, I will follow you. And he did on the way to Jerusalem. So this is Bartimaeus, who now can see many things that he could not see before. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, well, thanks to, to Doug Berkey for this, Boy, he's a, that we can, we can see Bartimaeus a bit better because of Doug's vision. So I'll put him down. So let's have a, a brief prayer and then we will we will welcome. Oh then I'll um then we'll go on with service. So let's pray about this story. Dear God, thank you for Bartimaeus's story. Thank you for healing him and giving him a new life. And thank you for healing us in so many ways and giving us a new life. We pray in the power of Jesus' name and the power of Jesus' love. Amen. 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 So today is a day of testimony. And so Aline helped me find this passage that we really like about testimonies. This is from Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 13 to verse 22. Now, when the people saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary people, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. Now, Acts is after Jesus' resurrection, so they're the ones who are carrying on the testimony. So when the people saw the man who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they ordered Peter and John to leave the council while they discussed the matter with one another. They were uncomfortable with what was going on. They said, what will we do with them? For it is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it, but to keep it from spreading further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. It's like, don't we need good news? And they're trying to squash the good news. I mean, what? Anyway, just sort of astounding that they couldn't celebrate this healing. So they called Peter and John and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And I'm sure Peter and John said, okay, we'll go home. Right? No. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to listen to God, you must judge. For we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and what we have heard. And after threatening them again, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all of them praised God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing had been performed was more than 40 years old. <laughs> that kind of struck me. It's like, 
you know, once you're 40, you're sort of doomed. You know, there's no hope. But, but Peter and John healed this person, and it was a great sign that could not be denied. And I think the phrase that kind of struck me for this day of testimony is, we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. So today we are delighted to be able to see and hear Cliff and his testimony and may it inspire us to share our testimonies as well. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cliff and I'm an alcoholic. Hello, Cliff. Right? Is that what we're supposed to say? Well, one way or the other. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit of my spiritual journey with you. My first trip through recovery started in uh, June 17, 1995. I went to treatment and I just couldn't get it together. You know, I never saw everybody else prospering in the program and I thought, wow, you know, something's wrong. And they actually had a, a counselor there, and he said, well, you know, it's okay to be mad at God. And I thought, no way, because if you're mad at God, you're going to be struck down. And that's the way it is, and you can't be mad at God. But the truth was, I was mad at God, because I had asked him many times to relieve me of this terrible burden, and it didn't happen. But I was unwilling to put legs on my prayers. I was unwilling to do what I was led to do. You know, I went, I tried all these different methods, different spiritual paths. I, I sped read the Bible, that's the word sped. Mm -hmm. good. I read it seven times in a row. But you know, I don't know how much you can get out of that. But, <laughs> and then I went to the church and prayed every day. And uh, at the end of that time, I was still an alcoholic and I just couldn't accept that. You know, I wasn't open to God's healing. And that's the, really the first part. You know, a person has to accept that they have a problem and that things are going bad. You know, so that's, that's what I had to do. I had to admit it. And I prayed and I became willing. And I believe today that God gives me the willingness. You know, it gives me the strength to go on and gives me the willingness. It's all a gift. I wouldn't be able to do it without his willingness. And I prayed for help many times, but uh, until I was ready to do the footwork, it just didn't work. It just didn't work. So I thought today I'd share a little bit about my spiritual journey. You know, it started then, and I, I kind of made the group my higher power because I sensed there was a spirit of recovery in that room. And I followed that path for 10 years, but I failed to grow. I just said, focused in on the fellowship and the yet comforting surrounding of other believers. And uh, like I said, that worked for 10 years, but I didn't grow. This hole that I had in my heart, even before I got sober, was, it was still there and it had begun to grow again. And I was beginning to consume different things. My old character defects came back. And uh, so I called a friend of mine and I said, well, you know, <clears throat> I think I'm going through a spiritual crisis. I don't know what it is. Something's wrong. And he says, well, are you going to enough meetings? I said, yeah, sure. Of course, I wasn't going to any meeting. <laughs> are you calling your sponsor? I said, yeah. But I didn't want to call him. He was a jerk. He always told me what to do. <laughs> so, uh, you know, are you doing any service work? And I said, yeah, but of course I wasn't doing that either. And uh, I wasn't working any steps. I wasn't going through the book. I wasn't reading literature. I wasn't reading the Bible. I'd quit praying, everything. I, it all fell away from me. And without any support from the program and no spiritual life, I went back, went straight back into sin. It reminds me of that story about the guy that he had a demon and he got rid of it. And then it, the demon roamed his dry places and came back and found his house swept and clean, but empty. There's nothing in there. Uh -huh. And so that's what happened to me. And I'm not saying, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about demons. 
I'm just talking about my disease mm -hmm. of, of addiction. You know, the addiction came back, and I looked for a way to go back to fill that hole in. And there, and I, I just, it wouldn't work. No matter what I did, it just got bigger and bigger. It consumed my home, my job, my vehicle, any relationships I had, family. It just consumed everything, and it kept getting bigger and bigger. And uh, so for three years, I went through a period of, of spiritual darkness. And I remember the first time that I started back, I started back uh, using. Immediately, I was severed from my conscious contact with my heart power because I turned away. I was not, I didn't want to connect with that source anymore. And that's the only source of life there is, in my opinion. My higher power is Jesus. And uh, he grows inside of me every day because he's the author of, our, of life. And um, so after three years, I, I've been praying for help, and I, I got willing to do, once again, whatever it took. So I had to go to a mental hospital for a while, and then I got out of there and went to treatment. I remember laying there in the treatment center, and it was in the darkest day, and I realized I could never live like that again successfully. I could never do that again. It was, it was the first moment where I realized I was totally powerless, and it was profound, and it was deeper than any other experience I'd had up to that point as far as realizing my powerlessness. And I knew that there was a source of hell. And so I turned and I prayed that God would take this terrible desire off of me. And he did, right then. And it's been a journey, you know, I, I, it's been an uphill battle. It's been, uh, I bet, felt like hoeing uphill. You know, it wasn't like before I floated on a pink cloud. Mm. This time around, I had to earn my steps. Mm. I had to build a foundation. I used to live in a house, we used to call it the rock house. And it was found, it didn't have, uh, it, had, it was foundation from the ground all the way up to the second story. It just rocks stacked on top of each other. And I thought about that, I think about that many times. That's the way I want my foundation in Christ to be. All the way to the top, not just the rocky, the, not the bottom, but I want it to be right up there, wherever I'm going, I want to always have that presence of God in my life. And so I just redid what I didn't do before. I got a sponsor, I, I call regularly. I read the literature that is provided and I, I read the Bible every day and I pray. And, and I, I go and I, I, I fellowship with other believers and uh, whether a person believes in the 12 steps or not, that's, it doesn't matter. I, I think they're all biblically based. Um, but like I say, some people don't believe it. But, uh, you know, I just had to speak my truth. What's worked for me. And it really has helped me a lot. It's kept me sober. My new sobriety day is uh, 10, 17, 11. Oh, and wow. I just had a 10-year mm -hmm. anniversary. 10 years. I always have... Uh, Think about what happened and what it was like now. What happened? What, what it was like? What happened? And what it's like now? And recently, I had been thinking about this this spiritual path that I've been on, and um, I thought about a guy that I met that told me about. He said him and two other guys got drunk and thought it'd be a good idea to go into an old West Virginia mine shaft. And steal copper wire at midnight. Well, that was a brilliant idea. <laughs> and they were drunk. And uh, it was it didn't turn out too well. He was the only one that managed to get out. And he told me about this terrible harrowing story. He said for three days he wandered in the dark, no light, running into walls, searching desperately, hallucinating. In the dark, no contact, no food, no nothing, no water, nothing. And he told me, he said, when I saw that first fleck of light, 
I thought it was a hallucination. But he followed it. It was the only thing he had. Followed that light and came out into the light of day. And the sun hit him and he was blinded because he'd been in the dark so long. He was covered with smut and dirt. He just fell on his knees and cried out, thank you, God. And that was me. I did, except mine lasted for three years. A friend called me in the darkest part and said, is this Cliff? We wonder what happened to you. Mm. And no, I didn't run and go straight and get help right then. But it was that fleck of light mm. that I needed mm. to lead me out of that darkness. And I tried to follow that ever since. And it's, it's been working for me. And I couldn't recommend this path more. Mm. Thanks. Amen. Um, would anyone like to just share a word of what it was like to hear his testimony or I, I mean I just like to I would uh, said if you want to you can after I do but what struck me was that when you said early on in your testimony about I didn't put feet on my prayer or something like that. Uh -huh. And I think that's our invitation today. Mm -hmm. How can we put feet on our prayers? Mm -hmm. So does anybody else have something that struck you about his testimony that you'd like to share? Or I know there are many things, but that we'll take it with us. And is there anything else you wanted to add? I'm just thankful that for this church and the uh, opportunity to share, you know, it, it's uh, being vulnerable is where I get my strength. In our vulnerability, our weakness is God's strength. And so, well, I think we have one final hymn to, to sing, and uh, you're invited to. I think also let's point to the fact that what Cliff said was it was the light that drew him out of the darkness. And one of my favorite texts is how in Christ there is no darkness. Christ is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And I think uh, your life is a testimony to that Cliff. And uh, I'm grateful. Just the tiniest fleck of light can dispel the deepest darkness. Amen. And thank you, Cliff. And the hymn is In Christ Alone, number Thanks. 33. What a what a what a fitting hymn. Yeah, Michael yeah. again has chosen has chosen well. <laughs> Thank you. 
I think the best benediction is, is what we always say, and I think it's what Cliff came through in his testimony, that through it all, through those three years, and all the years before, mm -hmm. up until this moment, that he has found God's love. And so, church, know you are loved, and there is nothing, nothing you can do about, can do about it. it. Amen. 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 Go in peace. Thank you.